my first major encounter with the system was in elementary school. I just moved back to St. Louis to live with my grandmother and her other, her other half at the time, which was, you know, the guy who was essentially my grandfather, um, acting in that role since I had been born. Uh, he was facing 35 years for a crime to which he pled innocent. So of course, you know, when a fed federal agency comes to your door to arrest your companion, you know, there was confusion. She often had a depressed mood. Uh, and for me, being the empathic little kid that I was, who was extremely, extremely close to and attentive to my grandmother, um, I felt all of that and I carried all of that. All those negative emotions that she tried to hide, I was internalizing as a little kid. And so, not knowing though, right? When you're that young, do you know what internalizing depression means? Yet it manifests in other ways that impacts your development uh, psychologically, emotionally, and intellectually. And um, so additionally, the trial proceedings, the rides that felt like forever to go visit him, and the waiting room times, like all of that felt like forever. And they were so fucking boring. It's like, man, what is going on with life? And um, the visits, they were bittersweet because we got to see them, yet they were short. And so uh, lastly, with this situation, there was a lot of attention. This was a case that made national news in the 90s. And so you know, our narrative and our concept was around him getting out. We can't wait to get out. He's innocent. Yet in church, at school, you know, people are like, we saw y'all on the news in court, and we said, you know, he, he shot at such and such, and blah, 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 blah. So it's like, again, as a kid, having to negotiate, well, damn, is he innocent? Is he guilty? You know, and, how, and the stigma that comes with being associated with something that's, that's projected, such, um, such a negative light. And he was acquitted, and I'll end, I'll end there with that story. Next, I want to go into productivity and financial disruption. So another point in time during which I wasn't living in St. Louis, my cousin, she had to get out of town quick uh, due to ongoing back and forth violence um, that kept involving more and more of my family members. And so while she was living with me, uh, she got arrested and I was in grad school at the time. And so I had to reorganize my life. I had to make sure that I went to see her every visitation because that's what she expected. She expected to see me for her sanity. And the wait times were crazy. You had to show up an hour before visitation actually started to stand in line or you would miss the visitation window. And then you would wait for hours for a 10 to 15 minute visit. And so during these visits, I'm trying to study for tests. Uh, and I'm frustrated because I feel like, whereas my support, uh, one of my friends, she was supposed to be holding me down while I'm holding my cousin down and she wavered. And Family members back in St. Louis wanted increased contact to know what was going on, and I'm gathering money, et cetera. Dealing with the bottleneck justice system of public defenders, like all, so all of these multiple factors were compounded onto my life as a black man coming from a certain element, attempting to perform and succeed while expecting to fail. And so at school, certain narratives about me being an angry black man, or getting in the program off of affirmative action, you know, those were things that was the context in which I was matriculating through the academic program. So I had to ensure that I beat your ass with my test scores and left you confused about how I'm outperforming you. And so, you know, that overarching narrative that sometimes some of us feel, we're being the representative for our race. And in an institution where my presence is discredited and marginalized, <clears throat> while fighting for my cousin who's in another institution that's dehumanizing to her existence. So after the Louisville situation was wrapped up, she was extradited to St. Louis for warrants that aligned essentially with the findings of the Department of Justice civil rights investigation that was conducted on the Ferguson Police Department. The police department focuses on generating revenue and the city leadership was stressing ticketing to their police officers. Predatory, which leads to predatory police practices. Predator, which leads to predatory court practices. People are being warranted and jailed for parking, traffic, housing code fines not paid. Hunting blacks, 67% of the population, 
blacks made up of Ferguson. 85, they were made up of, they made up 85% of the stops, 90% of the citations, and 93% of the arrests. Community distrust, right? That's what all of that leads to. So that's a whole fucking, pro a whole process. A predatory process that facilitates incarceration. So that's what disrupts my family. That's what disrupts my communities. And this has been for generations. So let's not forget, or did we even know, that police departments were first created to hunt. To hunt and catch runaway slaves and terrorize black and indigenous communities. And that legacy still lives on. The legacy of dehumanization is the root of the Ferguson uprising. So when you hear words, the words at risk apply to our populations, we don't have so much as at risk populations, rather we have at risk capitalists. <clears throat> we have at risk capitalists who've created and worked to sustain hierarchies of power, colonization and oppression, and we must prioritize our institutional learning and actions around these ideals in order to dismantle these beloved systems of white supremacy because your beloved systems are smothering our souls. 